Now, if you'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. (coughs) Romans chapter 7. I've entitled this message, The Wretchedness of Jesus. And uh, I entitled it because that, like that, because uh, we'll see indeed that that is an applicable phrase, plus uh, that will gain attention because people rarely ever associate the word wretch with the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's start here in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Now this is Paul's confession. Now we're accustomed to singing amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And we take that word wretch to mean a despicable person. Uh, Someone so low that they don't deserve a place in polite society. And you know, in English... That definition works. But that's not what the Greek word here means. It has a more practical meaning. Like many words in many languages, this word here is made by joining two words together. And the first word is the word in the King James that's often translated talent. You know, uh, the Bible talks about one man had, you know, one talent, another had five talents, and another had ten talents. And actually, that's just an old-fashioned weight measure. Of course, that gave opportunity to the, uh, those who trained me in youth to say, and you have a talent, you know, and um, we even had the song, you have a talent, use it for the Lord. If you do not use it, you will surely lose it. You have a talent, use it for the Lord. And they were talking about what natural talents we might have. You know, oh, you can sing, sing for the Lord. You can do this, do it for the Lord. That's not what the word talent in the King James Version means at all. It's like ounces or pounds or whatever. I don't know exactly how much a talent is. In fact, it varied from place to place and from time to time. But the point is, it's a weight. It's a weight. And then the second half of the word means to bear. And so when he says um, wretched man, he's saying I'm bearing a weight or it became basically to mean enduring affliction. One who endures an affliction is what is meant here when it says, oh wretched man, that I am. When Paul says, I'm a wretched man, he's not pointing specifically to the sinfulness of his flesh. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. There are plenty of people in this world who are horribly sinful, and yet they are not wretched in the sense of this word because they don't find their sin to be a burden. They don't have a conflict within themselves. This is what I want to do, and that's what I do. Paul said, what a wretched man I am, because he was living under the burden and under the affliction of desiring to do what is good, but being unable to perform it. When I was young, in fact, I started playing Uh, In the sixth grade, I started playing trumpet and got fairly good at it for an amateur. And I played it all the way up into my 40s. And I could leave it sit for a year and pick it up and in just a little bit, 
be right back where I was. But I let several years go by. And now I pick that thing up and I try to play like I used to and it's nothing but frustration. And I just put it right back in its case and forget about it. Now, that's just an illustration. There is within me, you might say, that old high school trumpet player, lead trumpet in the stage band, this sort of thing, who could play. And he's still in there, but I just can't do it. Well, Paul says that in him, that in his flesh, that is in his flesh, there's nothing good. Yet in his mind, he wants nothing but good. In his inner man, he wants to do what is right. He said, but I can't find a way to do it. Consequently, He says, I am a man under affliction. I am a man suffering affliction. He was wretched. Now, I went to that scripture primarily so that we would learn what the nature of being wretched is in the Bible. Turn with me now to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Verse 7, the first line says this. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Now, our Lord, especially during that time, he was hanging on the cross, could have said, O wretched man that I am, afflicted. And it wasn't just any affliction. It says in verse 4, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. And while they did that, in a self-righteous way. Those Jews who had gathered together and conspired to get the Romans to crucify him, they mocked him, and they said he's, you know, he's been, well, this is, he's getting what he deserves from God. Now, the truth of the matter is they were saying more truth than they thought they were. But they thought or what they thought was wrong with him and what had earned him the uh, affliction at the hand of God was not what he was suffering for. In fact, what they thought he was suffering for was the actual truth about him. He made himself out to be God. Well, that was true. They charged him with blasphemy. He said he was king of the Jews, and that was true. So they charged him with sedition. They actually thought that he, by his own actions, had made himself worthy of the affliction that was being poured out on him from God. Well, the affliction that was being poured out on him was indeed from God. And in a strictly legal sense of the word, he was worthy of it. But here's the reason he was worthy of it. Verse 6 of Isaiah 53. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a weight that must have been. To bear the weight, to be under the weight of affliction. He was <clears throat> wounded for our transgressions, not his own. Yes, he owned them as his own. That is, when he bore them before the Lord, he did not try to get a lesser penalty by saying, really, I didn't do these. He bore them before the Lord as though he himself was the one guilty of them. But we know it was our transgressions, our iniquities that were laid upon him. How was he afflicted? Under what burden did he live his entire life? Well, he was Here's an affliction our Lord suffered. He lived in a world made by him, sustained by him, but everyone in it was in rebellion against his father. And the world was broken and didn't work right. He did nothing but good, nothing but what the father wanted him to do and sent him to do. And the response he got was hate, anger, malice. When he gets to the cross, the best treatment he got is worded this way. All his disciples forsook him and fled. He lived in that world. He lived in a world, he's the righteous one, he's the perfect one, sinless, spotless, no desire for sin, and yet he lived in a world full of it. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to live among people whose um, status in life has, uh, I don't know how to put this, but they just don't live as civilized would be the word as we do normally. And I mean, that, that's true everywhere in the world. You've got various people, you've got those that, that live very fine, very clean, very orderly lives, and you have people in the middle, and you've got people down here who, um, for whatever reason, they live in filth. And to be among them, it, it kind of makes us feel uncomfortable. We don't want to stay there. Imagine our Lord being here among us. I suppose it's good when we visit uh, those like, uh, well, they used to put them in insane asylums. I don't even know if there is such a thing anymore, but it used to be when people had mental problems which incapacitated them, they put them in <clears throat> mental asylums and um, insane asylums. And I remember going there uh, to a couple of them that were in our area, and uh, we were playing, me and some of my friends were playing Christmas carols for them. And I wanted to get out of there. Uh, many of the people looked horrible. Uh, many of them, I actually I imagine many of them had been, been drugged to the point they could hardly respond to anything because that's how they kept them in control. But they'd sit there and they'd just slobber. And if they did talk, they talked nonsense. And you think, okay, I'll come in, I'll play my carols, then I'm going to leave. Don't want to be there. And yet our Lord came down here a bunch in, in this world full of spiritually insane people. People who have lost all common sense. 
any attachment to reality. They profess themselves to be wise when they're fools. They profess themselves to be righteous when they are nothing but sin. They profess themselves to be powerful when they're nothing but weak. And he lived this and he endured not only their presence, but they actually spoke out against him. As it is written, the insults that <clears throat> were directed to you, meaning to God, fell on me. That's our Lord speaking there. The hatred, the natural hatred that man has toward God fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. He went around doing nothing but good. And they thought nothing but evil against him. He bore our sin, the sin of God's people. Here is one, you know, Paul said, with my mind, I serve the law of God with my flesh, the law of sin. But nobody served and loved God like Jesus Christ did. And yet there on the cross, Jehovah laid on him the iniquity of all his people. And I'm not going to try to, to get any deeper in an understanding of it, except I know, or I feel, that that experience of having our sins charged to him was horrible. Horrible. Even if we think of it only in terms of uh, the imputation, that is, you know, it's, a, it's just a legal transfer of sin from one person to another. He bears the responsibility of it, but everybody involved knows that he really didn't do it. That's bad enough. How would you like to be accused of some horrendous crime you didn't do? And know that the whole world thinks you're guilty. But our sins were laid on him. And he felt the weight of them. Here is one who desired and had experienced eternal, unbroken, perfect union with God. And he is afflicted such that he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And the very one who is the source of all life died. Now if being wretched means bearing up under affliction, bearing up under um, a difference between what you would want and what you're actually experiencing. There has never been anybody more wretched than the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even those in hell are in such a wretched condition as he was. Those in hell they're bearing the punishment of their sins. But them, I mean, sin is something they wanted. They don't want the pain that comes from it. But it's not as though they're down there agonizing over the fact they're sinners. They're not agonizing over the fact that God has forsaken them. They weren't interested in him anyway. But everything our Lord desired was taken from him. He was utterly deprived of every help. Utterly deprived of anything that would have brought him joy. The 
looking back at now at Lamentations chapter 3. <clears throat> I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. Now, these were the words of the prophet Jeremiah, and I'm certain that in some regard he was experiencing these same things. But we know that these prophets spoke, and that when they spoke, quite often they were, they were speaking as the Lord. They were speaking what would be going through his heart and mind during his sufferings. And as you go on, and and we read this earlier, but I mean, there's some things in there describing this affliction, which are so obviously applied to what our Lord experienced, then we just apply this whole description to him. He's the one who has seen affliction. Now, you and I have our afflictions. We have our troubles. Uh, We have afflictions, that is, suffering under uh, a difference between what we want and what we uh, have. We have health afflictions. We have wealth afflictions. Uh, We have um, mental afflictions. We have uh, afflictions about everything because probably all of us desire more or something different from what we presently have. But he says, I am the man who has suffered affliction. Nobody was afflicted like our Lord was. Those other two thieves that were hung on crosses, one on either side of him. Yes, you could say, oh, they are are wretched. Remember now the word wretched as it's used in the Bible is not about character, it's about circumstances. And you might say that they're as in wretched a condition as the Lord Jesus is. No, they're not. No, they're not. Physically, they're suffering things similar to him. But what was going on within his soul as God made his very soul, his very life, to be an offering for sin, they weren't experiencing that. Our Lord dived deep into wretchedness and dived so far he hit bottom. None was more wretched than him. Now we have a word of comfort after he's described all his affliction. He does say in verse 22 of Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. He knew what was going on. He knew why it was going on. Even as he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He understood the theology behind it. But it was still a heart-wrenching experience. But he knew. He knew of the Lord's mercy. And the Lord was his portion. The Lord was all he wanted. And he would wait for him. And indeed... Our Lord waited, and three days later, the Lord rescued him, so to speak, brought him out 
of death and later raised him to his right hand and granted him everything his heart desires. And he went from the most wretched man to the most blessed man. These are the wonders of God's way of salvation. Our Lord not, did not dip his toe into God's wrath. He did not take a sip from the cup of God's wrath. He plunged deep into it and went to the very bottom of it. And he drank the wine of wrath down to its very dregs. And the result is he is the most blessed man in all creation. He is God and he is man. As God, infinitely blessed, and as man, likewise blessed. Now look over at <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. This is the Lord speaking to the church in Laodicea. <clears throat> Verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. One of the things I have noticed in popular Christianity in America is that they do everything they can to make people feel good about themselves. They, I, I remember one, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but uh, there's a poster-like thing that, you know, shows a picture of a little kid. And uh, it says something like, you know, I know I'm good because God don't make no junk, you know. Missing the whole point. And I've heard people say, build up your self esteem based on how God perceives you. Really? Self esteem, as we understand the word, has to do with taking stock of yourself. And, and that's purely on the human level, but taking stock of yourself and say, okay, among men, I'm all right. Grace was never given to us to make us feel better about ourselves. <laughs> we certainly can feel better about our destiny. But if there's anything that grace teaches us, is that indeed we are wretches. Indeed, we are wretches not only in the sense that uh, Paul was mentioning it, we are wretched in those other English definitions that can be given to the word, which means despicable. There is that aspect of us, as Paul said, in which there is nothing good, no good thing. I remember, and this was a long time ago, you know, that's one of the things about growing older. There's a point at which you no longer learn the new phrases of the day. <laughs> and so sometimes things come up to me and it seems to me like, okay, this is how they're saying it today. But no, this, this was quite a while ago, but it's still, I think it's, it's kind of powerful. There was a poster. Just what part of no do you not understand? In my flesh dwells no good thing. And that flesh is yet a part of us. 
And yet, in our spirit dwells no evil thing because it's been born of God. It's, it has been conformed to the image of Christ. It believes God, loves God, longs for God, seeks God. And so you have these two natures coming into conflict because they both must occupy a single consciousness. And that's what Paul was talking about. I'm under affliction because I've got these within me, these two different ways of thinking and doing and neither one of them is ever satisfied. The Laodiceans thought they'd achieved something. They thought to themselves, everything's good. We're fine. And they thought that because <clears throat> evidently they were, for that day, rather wealthy and thought they didn't need anything. Oh, this, the Bible talks about the deceitfulness of riches. It gets so bad that riches and having them gives us the idea that we don't need God. And you say, well... I would never think that. Well, let me ask you something. When you are sure of sufficient money to pay your bills for the next several months, do you feel your need of God to sustain you from day to day? But get a layoff notice, <laughs> particularly if you're the kind that lives from hand to mouth. You know, the, the money you get in one month gets all spent been up that month so you get a layoff notice you don't have any work and the bills are going to keep coming but the money supply has been shut off all at once we start to call on God there's some Laodicea in all of us we think we've got a handle on this and the Lord says no you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Who is wretched in this world? The unbeliever isn't wretched. He will be. But in the sense we're using the word, he's not wretched right now. This is his world in a sense. He's a sinner and this is a sin-cursed world. This is his native home. He is not spiritually wretched because he's spiritually dead. There isn't a conflict in him between flesh and spirit because all he is is flesh. He certainly feels he has no need of anything because he's not experiencing the conflict. He has a conscience that bothers him, but he'll find a way to make an excuse for that. Who's wretched? The believer. You say, I feel like such a wretch. Good. You're in good company. Our Lord was the most wretched man that ever lived. And it's because of the wretchedness that he experienced that you presently experience wretchedness. The dissatisfaction with who and what you are and what you do. The continually, continual longing for something you can't quite get a hold of here. But we are convinced. Because of the Lord's love, we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. 
What the world calls night, we call morning. They look at the grave and they say, oh, they're going into that deep night of death. The believer looks and says, I see the sun rising. I see the end of my wretchedness. I'm a man who's seen affliction, but it's just about done. The morning comes, and with it, the fullness of the Lord's mercy. He will not only put away my sins from his sight, he'll put them away from my sight. I will bear them no more. He is my portion. And while I sit here living with the conflict between what I want to be in spirit and yet what I am in flesh, I'm not going to try to fix that problem. I'm not saying I won't try to restrain the flesh, but I, you can't make the flesh anything other than what it is. No, I will wait for him. And when he comes, whether he comes in the clouds to wrap up history or he comes for us individually and calls each to himself one by one, when he comes, it's the morning. And all God's mercies come with it. Father, bless your word as you can, as only you can. Make us lay hold of it in all of its power. Well, maybe, Lord, it would be better to pray, may the word lay hold of us with all its power. Transform us. Pierce into the darkness of our thinking and bring light. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. You can take out your chorus books once again and turn them to number 19. My heart and voice I raise, number 19 in the chorus books, and we'll stand as we sing. 